I think in due south was a, a very serious, loopy, nutsy, dramatic, emotionally honest, intellectually goofy, urban fable. It was conflicting cultures of two countries who are, who are right next to each other. Canadian and American. It turns out they have humor. Canadian cop Mountie, who still trusts, still trusts in the goodness of humanity. Due South is a folk tale, and trying to teach people that there's a better way to do things. The first time I heard about it, I was, I was actually in Los Angeles, and my agent had called there and said, there's a pilot that they're making in Canada. Would you be interested in doing this? And I didn't, at the time, want to do a series, so I said no, and I didn't read it, actually. My agent called me. Uh, it was pilot season. He says, I got this interesting pilot called Due South, about a Canadian Mountie and a Chicago cop. Uh, it's written by Paul Haggis, and I said, who? And he said, Paul Haggis, he uh, won an Emmy for 30-something, very talented writer. I said, yeah, sure, send it to me. Anyway, it came back eventually. And uh, he said, would you at least read it this time? And I, by that time, it was kind of the new season in Hollywood, and I'd been reading just one terrible script after another after another and thinking, do I really want to be Fred's boss at the rock pile in the Flintstone movie? Or, you know, there was just stacks of horrible stuff. You can't imagine how much dreck there is. And then I thought, well, I'll read this, even though I didn't particularly want to do a series. And it made me laugh. By the second page, I think I was laughing out loud, which almost never happens. I said, yeah, sure, send it to me. And I gave it a read, and I found it very clever, very funny. Um, I didn't get a lot of the Canadian references, but I gave it a shot anyway. Most of the parts that you see in television series, or most of the parts that you see in most movie scripts, for that matter, are kind of, they're kind of built upon a different, a, a preceding character. There's sort of a long line of these, oh, that's like this, which was like that. There's really very little that I could think of when I first read this that this character resembled and seemed utterly unique. And also I had, absolutely no idea how to go about playing it, so that seemed like a pretty good challenge. And I had to do three scenes for the audition, and I was having, the first two were easy, and I was banging them out. Uh, I was working on them with uh, my wife, and there was this one, the consulate scene. Now, he's, he's standing outside the consulate, and he can't talk. This is your job? This is like your real job? Do you believe it? This is his job. They actually pay people to do this in Canada. <laughs> Sorry. I was having just a hell of a time with it, and I called my agent the night before, and I said, you know, I'm going to pass. He said, what? I said, well, you know, it's, I don't think it's really for me. He says, no, no, you don't understand. This is this is a, a, a big pilot, and uh, it's got a lot of money. And if it goes to series, you could be a millionaire. Okay, what time do you want me to show up? When I first met David Marciano, um, I thought this is kind of perfect. We come from we came from entirely different worlds. He's from New Jersey, Italian, living in Los Angeles, really American, no interest in anything to do with Canada. I was an urban boy, and um, you know he was a royal boy. So, you know, there was uh, 
you can't really come from two more different worlds. And we didn't immediately get along at all. I mean, we didn't have, I mean, not that we didn't, we didn't not get along. We just, there was nothing, there was no immediate kind of click. And I think we both thought, well, well let's just leave it like this because it'll actually be relatively good when we start filming. And there, there was kind of an immediate, the, the distance between the two of them showed up right away. We didn't have to work to not understand each other. It only takes an extra second to be courteous. After you, man. Oh, after you, sir. Are we going to get on or what? Tom, um, I bet he's doing a lot of high-speed chases in Canada, huh? There's the, the oddity of having a show set in America but shot in Canada featuring a Canadian going to America but the only one being American coming to Canada seems perfectly in keeping with television and more more in keeping with the lunacy of American television. I think it made sense for a Canadian and for it to be filmed in Canada because when I mean Paul Haggis is Canadian and uh, when uh, Canadians are uh, grow up in the shadow of America, so we we were always consumed by this comparison thing and con the yeah. problems between the two cultures and, and the good things and the bad things, and so we could define that better than America because in America, they probably wouldn't come up with the premise of a, of a Mountie coming down to America because to to America Canada is resources uh, and a kind of uh, irrelevant country that's up there. Ice and another another state or whatever some place where we can go on holiday for cheap we did how we did go to Chicago once in a while I never went but we would send down a camera unit so they would shoot little bits and pieces of Chicago skyline and scenery and stuff and then make it look as though we were there it might have been a little weird for David Marciano who is very American he's now he so what it's kind of a show within a show for American to come up to Canada to shoot a show about a uh, Canadian going down to, to the States. So th it was actually kind of strangely reversed for him. The irony of a Mountie coming to Chicago, but an American going to Canada to shoot the show uh, made perfect sense. I mean, doesn't it? It's the two sides of the same coin. I'm going to go to the gas station. I'll be right back. Sam Dalton made only one mistake. He planned everything but how he was going to spend the money. Before he'd hit White Horse, he'd left a trail of 20s that took me right to his door. And Sam's case was nothing like this. No, I know, but what I can't seem to find is... Hello, son. Hello, Dad. How are you? I'm dead, son. Other than that, do you mean? No, that's what I was asking. Oh, that's good. Never be ashamed to ask a stupid question, sir. I taught you that, didn't I? Not specifically, no. Well, no time like the present. Well, the appearance of Gordon Pinson is kind of an interesting one, because it wasn't planned, I don't think. And I remember being up in Skagway in Alaska, where we were staying when we were shooting the pilot. And they said, well, let's see what happens. You've got to come up north now and get shot and uh, for the pilot. And I said, well, get someone else to do that. I mean, you know. This one. Oh, come on, Gordon. So up I went. Haggis's intention was to have him shot and then possibly have him returned by way of these diaries. And we were in the bar in Skagway and I'm saying, you gotta be crazy, you got Pinson? Don't shoot him, don't kill him, you gotta bring him back. And Paul's like, how, how do I bring him back? Well, he can be a ghost, he can come back as a ghost. Don't be ridiculous, we'll never have a ghost in this show. We'd, we'd sit at the bar and uh, the three of us would dream up ways in which to bring him back in human form, <laughs> in sort of living form and, and uh, and they thought that that would be an added kind of, of added interest to the viewers. But when I bug him for show after show, that we have to bring Pinson back. So then slowly Gordon started returning in uh, voiceover. I'd be reading his diaries, and then you kind of hear him talking. And then I'd say, well, wow, you've got him already back. Now he's talking in voiceover. You look. You really should just bring him back in the flash. No, no, no. And then, sure enough, one of the scripts showed up, and there he was in the back seat of a car. So did you just happen to pick this moment to reappear? Well, obviously, you needed my help, son. And it was my fault. But I better prepared you. You wouldn't be floundering around like this. Well, I'm not completely over my head, Dad. I mean, I... No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't try to make me feel better, son. 
I failed you as a father. But. Yeah, we had endless conversations about the ghost rules, which only ever seemed to apply for as long as the scene you were doing took to shoot, and then those rules would go out the window and we'd invent new ones. Wonderful, stupid conversations on the set very often about the rules of a ghost, about the rules of can a ghost, can a ghost tap someone on the shoulder? Can a ghost slap someone if they don't like the way they're acting? Or does the hand go right through the face? Take my hand. Ah! You're dead. No time to be choosy. Oh, my mistake. But nothing surprised um, him. Everything surprised his son. Grab the lamp, he'll crack his skull, make it look like a freak lighting accident. A freak lighting accident? Oh, sure, sure. Happens all the time. Lightning strikes the wire, sends a jolt through the line. Lamp hops up, hits him in the skull, splits it in two, and you never had a chance to prevent it. Happens so fast. He began to appear as though he were in the, uh, the clean and dapper and respectable Mountie kind of um, image. And that was fine. That was fine. Uh, we did a few things to the uniform from time to, so, you know, some things had to get permission from the Mounties themselves. Uh, they were pretty particular. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is a very stuffy organization in general, very concerned about their imagery, and for good reason, because they got into a lot of, they did a lot of really stupid things for a while and, and got a lot of bad press. So they were very concerned about it, and they didn't like the idea of this. I'm not sure if anyone had ever read the show, but in any event, they hated the very idea of making Due South, and so they weren't going to allow us to use the uniform. I have always considered myself to be a diligent officer who's conducted himself with loyalty and obedience. However, this uniform, I have worn this uniform with pride my entire career, as my father wore his and many before him. To me, it is much more than just a, a piece of cloth. It is a tradition that links me to every officer who has ever worn it and acquitted himself with honor and integrity. And while it is not the current fashion I would be hard-pressed to change it without feeling that I had in some way betrayed that tradition. They were most particular, you know, the Mounties with their image. Um, and in this particular case, uh, they hummed and hawed and they shrugged a bit, but they let things go because they were of a... They, sh they showed a humor. The Sam Brown belt was actually on backwards in the pilot and the hat had a, a badge on it, which they don't have. And all of my buttons were fire department buttons, not RCMP buttons. Anyway, then they finally saw the show, and I guess they decided that it was a good thing. And so then we could actually use the real uniform once we were making the show. Paul never complained about the costume in anything other than, you know, being vocal, vocal about a particular moment. Uh, we shot throughout the summer. You know, some days were 95, 100 degrees, and he's in this wool mounty suit with the full garb underneath. The problems I had with the suit was it used to rub his neck raw. It was so starched in the collar and being wool, and we'd be out there some days, and he would be raw all across here. Then I'm, of course, only adding to it by trying to cover that up for him so we can continue shooting. They're hot, generally. It's wool. Um, the one nice thing about it is it improves your posture almost instantly because they're built in such a way that that neck, if you try to slouch at all, you pretty much decapitate yourself. So it helps with good posture. I think he was a real hero when it came to wearing the Mountie outfit, because it certainly isn't anything that I'd want to spend those 14 hours a day in. She don't want to know why I'm wearing a uniform. I just assumed it was something personal. Yeah, I think that Ray and Benton together made a very good team. Uh, Benton, for all of us, being able to speak 80 languages and smell things in dog shit, and Ray for his keeping Benton somewhat out of trouble. When you come in contact with someone who's, he's alone, in this, in this city. He has no friends, he has no one. His father's just been killed. Um, what greater gift can I, you give this man than to help him get what he wants? Why did those two characters like each other if they were so opposite to one another in their approaches and the rest of it? They needed each other, I think is the answer. I think they needed each other. It was be unimaginable, I suppose, to see that either one of them would really be very successful on their own. And, and certainly, Ray was kind of portrayed that, set up a little bit that way, that he, 
he was, you know, not really the world's greatest cop, but together made them, and neither was, and Benton didn't belong there, so, but, so they wouldn't really have been successful on their own, but put together, they made a great team. Can you give me a reading, please? Uh, it's your compass, you read it. I can't. Well, neither can I. Well, you'll have to, Ray. Why? I'm blind. You're blind? Apparently. You're, you're really, really blind? As a bat. Well, why didn't you say something? No point making a bad situation worse. Alone, we're both good, but together, we're better, you know? And like any partnership, the only reason to have a partnership is because what you do together is better than what you do alone. And that's what Do South was about. And the brown one was somewhat antiquated. I'm told that this is the current fashion. I think it's kind of cute. Thank you kindly, Francesca. Look, you just keep your eyes on the road and you keep your eyes in your head. I think uh, Franny's attraction to Frazier was that he was different from any other guy she'd personally ever known. I think to Franny, Frazier was like the knight in shining armor that she'd only read about, she'd only heard about didn't really think that this type of guy existed. And then lo and behold, it's her brother's, you know, partner. So, um, of course, to her, she thought, well, he's hooked up with my brother, which naturally means he should be hooked up to me. So that was, of course, her, uh, her everyday intention. The appeal of him was definitely that he had no clue what to say to a woman or what to do, you know, and how to dress, anything. It was like you just wanted to take him out and buy him dinner and talk to him and yeah. He just had this appeal of being very nerdy but dashing in his red uniform. And It's, it's very funny, you know, that play, playing any part, you really are playing a part. And so when people would f f send, because I did get a lot of fan mail and still do, but the, it isn't for me, it's actually <laughs> for him, and I think that's, there's a, once you realize that, it's fairly easy to see it for what it is. That I'm quite sure if all of them, if it was me in that part, or if that part was written to be me, I think the volume of mail would have been very thin indeed. Saturday last, your sister came to my apartment in the middle of the night, dressed in what can only be described as less than requisite attire, and offered herself to me. Okay, great, now beat it. My sister? I think Franny and Elaine um, actually had an understanding. I think they both knew that neither one of them was going to win this man. But you know, they enjoyed the competition. So therefore it was kind of a friendly competition. Since they knew in the end, there really wasn't gonna be a game. I'm standing at his door, I drop my coat, I look at him and he looks at me you know how a squirrel looks just before you hit him? Mm. Elaine would have, you know, I don't know, organized his sock drawer or something. Hardly think so. I think she would have removed, never mind. <laughs> no, I think Elaine would have, uh, I think Elaine would have been good for Fraser for a little while. But Francesca, Francesca would have brought him passion. She would have brought him excitement. She would have brought him a whole other world that he was never a part of. Probably intentionally, but nonetheless, she would have shown him a whole other side. I think she would have shown him a good time. Oh my God, that sounds horrible. I meant like a good time and like she would have taught him a thing or two about what to say to women and not and like, you know, she would have been like, look, Fraser, this is what you have to do and this is what you don't do, you know? And okay, now do the, you know, she would have, she would have put him in his place. Elaine had balls. Can I ask you a personal question? Francesca? Francesca. Vecchio. Vecchio. In fact, that was a big debate. Should the Mountie get a little thing going on, get, you know, a uh, romantic thing, get his romantic thing game on for quite a while. I don't think that was even, they even touched on that until the second. No, but it was probably in their season. heads from the very start because that's the idea of the characters, they can't loosen up. Yeah, but uh, I, I think it kind of showed another side to the character <laughs> that people wanted well, to see. Well, human. People wanted to see that. Yeah, you know, they wanted to see this, this sort of... Uh, he was in love with his dog. 
That's he works. <laughs> <laughs> Different interview. <laughs> I think Benton Fraser's appeal to women is really just twofold, two things. One is <clears throat> the uniform is snappy and the dog is a definite attractant. I got gotcha. you. Where are you going now, fella? Hi. Diefenbaker, remember what I told you. Benton Fraser, RCMP. And this is my dog, uh, Wolf. I thought that was a wolf. Well, he's mine now, because you sure as hell don't have a wolf license. In fact, he does. In terms of the, the dog itself, I think, you know, particularly the, the female audience, uh, and as it relates to animals, forget about it. You know, it. It's a done deal. Stick a fork in it. It's done. When it comes to animals and, and uh, leading men and dogs, there's something about that man in uniform and, and, and an animal. You know, the dog got um, five share points. You take the dog out and you lose, uh, you lose about 20% uh, of your audience. Yeah, uh, especially with young kids. They love the dog. But you know, we had about three different dogs. And um, Rick was the dog handler for the last two years. His dog was fantastic. Could do anything. The first two years, I don't think they had some problems with them. You know, like their dogs, you know. They're not actors. <laughs> That always works for me, personally, you know. So you watched the episodes with the dog? Actually, I watched all of the episodes when they ran. I was excited. Actually, one time, I because I was sad that they weren't actually using me enough, I read an episode and I was going, this is all about the dog. <laughs> I get, it's completely a dog show. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, there were episodes where it was <laughs> all about the dog I and know. his friends. <laughs> I don't think we ever had an episode. We like, said, well, you know we had a couple In retrospect, like it's fair enough. And, you know, it's kind of cute. You know, well, um... There must be something to be said when a dog is getting more attention than you in the audience. I know, that's for sure. The show that wouldn't go away. Yeah, CBS cancels Due South after one season. And I say, oh, well, you know, my shot at being a millionaire is over. Maybe I'll only be a quarter millionaire, you know. Um, on to bigger and better things. But network uh, executives are... Uh I don't know. I don't know how they get where they get because they don't seem, that's not how I would handle it. But they do it with all sorts of shows. I don't think anybody was aware in the beginning um, how responsible the fans were for the show returning um, after the threat of it being canceled. Uh, we found that out after, um, once we were already uh, in progress of, of the show being back on. I never doubted that we'd be back each year. Um, it, um, uh, and not so much from anything I read or not so much from anything people were telling me about network response or this or that, uh, just from people on the street, just from uh, emails, just from all that kind of stuff. People love that show. It, you know, it's a, it's a peculiar thing because it was such a, an enormous success virtually everywhere. And, and if today it were on a network in the United States, it would be an out-and-out -out hit. But at the time, it was kind of what they called on the bubble. It was successful, but not a runaway. And then they, the regimes changed at CBS. And that every time someone comes new into a network, they tend to change everything. Four months later, I get a phone call. They found money. The production co company Alliance decided to just go ahead anyway. And then CBS's new season was going in the toilet. And CBS aired, I mean, viewed several of the episodes and they liked what they saw and they picked up the show and we were back on the network. When they said, we got 22 more, I went, oh my God, what a nightmare. Everyone else was really happy. I just couldn't, I was just, they weren't doing enough with me, my characters, so I was, I was furious. <laughs> Why Daniel Cash wanted to leave the show, I don't really know. I think he felt that probably he wasn't getting enough screen time or he thought he could do better elsewhere. The thing that sells the show, or sold that show, was the Mountie and the Chicago Cop. You wanted to be a star. You wanted well, to be a I movie am a star, star at home. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> My kids think I'm a star. He wanted, he wanted to go to you Hollywood and be a big star. Oh, absolutely. You're, you're a star, uh, Daniel. 
Uh, we're all sizing on, right, I guess? If an actor has to leave the series, um, the writers conveniently write a scene that, that uh, kills them off or they, they die accidentally or something happens to help them be able to leave the show. I burst into Paul Haggis' office and demanded that he kill me. <laughs> they were mad. Everyone was mad at me. They thought I was a spoiled brat or whatever. Uh, that he wanted to do something, like, that I wanted to do something that I probably wouldn't achieve and all that. And I totally understand all of that attitude and I understood then. Uh, but there was no way that the show was... I was afraid I was going to spend another th three years doing this and it was... Uh, this is a period in my life where I wanted to push forward and, and attempt to go further in some directions. And I, it was just, everyone was furious. I mean, they just, to be honest, I mean, they just thought I was a silly man and, and maybe I was. Lewis! As an exit, being blown up in a car is terrific, I think. Well, that was very nice that he didn't just sort of leave. It was sad, you know. It was kind of sad uh, to lose the car. <laughs> no. Yeah, I miss Danny. Danny was fun to have around on the set. Did you miss me? Who? Did, Did I miss you? Personally, or do I miss Dewey? You didn't miss Dewey. <laughs> you, know, you still have Dewey. Yeah, I missed you, Daniel. <laughs> Make you feel better? Yeah. Okay. We moved, we moved into pretty heavy stuff sometimes, and then pretty just fluffy, light, funny stuff. Great dress, Niemann. Sears. Really? Looks fabulous on you. Thank you. I'll call you back. Paul Gross and Drag, that's, that's definitely something that's gone down in, in my memories of Due South. We had so much fun doing that. I'll do the job. I don't even know who you are. Actually, I believe you do. I'm sorry, I don't. Ray, it's me. Frazier? Yes, dressing up as a woman seemed like a good idea on paper. And in fact, if I recall, it's something I think I might have even suggested to Haggis or to somebody at some point. Just, you know, we should do a drag episode. It was a fatal mistake. And if anybody's watching this who thinks that might be a good idea, I would really counsel them not to pursue that. It's painful. I don't know who the diabolical fiend was who designed female undergarments, but they're hideous. There's nothing more revolting than pantyhose and bras are disgusting, and high heel shoes are ludicrous. It's horrible, horrible. First of all, the, um, the wardrobe department had to outfit him and try and give him somewhat of a girlish figure because he does not have a girlish figure at all. He's, he's not a huge man, but he's a big man, so the minute you put him into a dress with breasts and shoulder pads and hipsters, uh, it, w it was quite hysterical, and then when we started pinning his hair and, and making him up and putting the false lashes on and then putting the wig on, and at the same time we're doing him, we're doing his stunt double too, so he wasn't alone in the crime. It, w it was outrageous, it really was. What really angered me, although he looked like a man in drag, he just ad adapted to the makeup. He was beautiful. His eyes were like gorgeous. I'd have killed to have eyes like that. It was uh, a good idea, but, but really unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> the wig was terrific, though. I liked my wig. I did want, one time, I, want, I just thought, I'm just going to see what it's like. I just wandered around the street. So I was a fairly big, big girl. <laughs> but it is weird to feel this thing, the snap of heads looking at you. I don't think I look too guy like, actually. Get down! Get down! You can really move for a big woman. <laughs> I like big women. Yeah, he's a much better looking man than he is a woman. Much better looking man. Well, 
Well, I was born up north of Great Slave, 1898, and I rode near all my life. All the Queen's Horses was just an absolute blast to do. That was so silly. And that really was kind of going way, way out there to the far end of silly comedy. That's a thundercloud. Well, I've been called a coward. Yes, well, we had, a, we had somebody. We took the train out, I think. We just sh shuttled it back and forth, about eight or nine miles back and forth, till we got the entire episode. We were out there for days, it seemed. Leslie, Leslie was in it, Leslie Nielsen. All over this ground, falling from these blue amber skies. We're gonna ride forever. You can't keep horsemen in a cage. Should the angels call, but it's only then when I pull in the rain. I'm trying to recall how we did the stunt where I'm under the train, because I have to crawl under the train to get to Leslie Nielsen, who's in, in the toilet. Sergeant Frobisher! Before you continue, may I have a word with you? Friend or foe? A friend, I assure you. Where are you? I'm right here, sir. Uh, in the sink? I, I, no, sir. To the rear. Great Scott Benton? I'm relieved to see you're all right, sir. It's a matter of opinion. What are you doing in my toilet? Well, I've come to debrief you, sir. Is something wrong with the door? <laughs> we have a problem, sir. That's actually how I got I Leslie to come and do it. I was in New York doing something, and he was staying at the Park Plaza, and I was just up the street, and I, I ran into him on the street, and I said, I, I've got this show that I'm writing. You should come and do it. So we met at the Oyster Bar in the plaza, and I started to describe it to him, and I said, look, it starts off, you have terrible gas and you have to go to the bathroom, and then I'm underneath there and we have a conversation through the, through the hole in the toilet. And he said, I'm in, I'll do it. <laughs> but as anyone who knows Leslie knows, Leslie has a hand fart machine and he uses this thing everywhere he goes and his whole mission in life is to make people laugh. And on one occasion I was having a scene with Paul and Leslie was getting off his horse, dropped his baton and leaned over to get it and this thing went. And I said to him afterwards, Leslie, <laughs> I got a scene with Paul here, okay? I got a long speech. Man, don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't let fly, please. Not when I'm doing this scene. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Leslie said, oh, fine, Gordon, fine. Well, of course he didn't, but the space that he left cracked me up. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing at it. So there was a lot of laughter. Controlling ourselves was a big issue on that because there were a lot of very spontaneous things happening and, and, uh, and uh, uh, in a very tight space. But it would, they had these little roomettes, and so I'd wander by and there'd be Leslie Nielsen, Gordon Pinson, in their red suits sitting side by side, and Gordon mumbles and Leslie's stone cold deaf, so the conversations were hilarious. He just goes, what? What? And every time, ah, ha, 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 and then they'd laugh. Then we go back again. Uh-huh. What do you got there? I found it. Found a break. What makes you think it's a break? It's written right on it. Break. Uh, could be a ruse. To what end? Something criminal. Are you insinuating that an entire design crew has deliberately mislabeled the key elements of a train? It's possible. I'm talking to a lunatic. Now, you see, listen, what's wrong with you, Buck? You discount everything but the probable. That's why you couldn't make that shot way Don't back then. Don't think that you can twist the knife. You know, that was springtime. I had my allergies. My eyes were cloudy. Whatever helps you sleep. This is the break, Bob. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to bring this train to a halt. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What? What are these? Wires. Oh, my God. They bypass the brakes. You better get a hold of Benton. This train is a runaway. This train is a runaway. Well, we were canceled at the end of the second year, and, uh, and we were actually down. It was pretty much over. The British, the BBC, and other foreign investors said, no, we'll help. Uh, we're not going to cancel that show. It's a great show, and we think it'll go. It was very surreal I mean, to hear the support system that we had around the world and hear how much everybody loved it and, and, 
and was basically the backbone of this show. And I was, you know, just living at home in Bolton, Ontario, doing a show thinking, wow, are you kidding? Like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that that many people supported the show. I got a call. I was in, I was in Toronto. I had another deal at CBS to, to, to do another show. So I would have had to talk to, convince Les Moonves, who was running the network at the time that I was going to leave for Canada. Um, I called him up and I said, uh, you know, Du South is back. He said, yes, I heard. What are you going to do? Not entirely sure exactly what happened with all of the, his negotiations with the company, but whatever happened, they weren't, obviously, they couldn't arrive at something that was mutually agreeable. And I said, you know, I'm going to honor my commitment. I made a commitment to you and to CBS, and I have a contract, and I'm going to honor that. Which was really too bad. I, it was, it was a good partnership that worked well, I thought. So everything is all right then? Yeah, Benny. Everything is all right. Well, that's good to hear, Ray. It's good to hear your voice. Listen, um, I want you to have a safe trip. And I will be in touch. All right, Ray. You understand that, uh, I will be in touch. As a friend? Yeah, Benny. As a friend. There's no question that the show missed David Marciano, but I think it's that that's one of those odd things. You know, you pick, I think Callum Keith Rennie, who came in to replace him, added a whole new thing to the show that it didn't have before, a kind of a sort of more of a renegade underbelly quality. And, and it, you know, if, the, if that had been flipped, if, if Callum had began the show and left and David had come in, <clears throat> the same answer would apply. Yes, the show misses Callum, but we got this whole other quality from David. Coming into a show, uh, replacing one of the leads was um, a major concern because you, I, I knew that that character had been, you know, obviously been followed from the start and didn't know how I would come across, didn't want to be an imp um, uh, like that character, similar but not like that character, and try to find my own way into an established character that's set with the lead of the show it was a very daunting task and really probably took five episodes before I sort of settled down into what it was I wanted to do. Well, the, the idea about how to replace him uh, actually was something that Paul Heggs and I had talked about in the first year. I don't even know how it came up, but we were in a trailer saying, how would you just replace a character? Would you have to do blah, 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 blah? I don't know, maybe someone was talking about not wanting to do it or something. Anyway, we were having this conversation and, and we decided, no, the best way to replace a character on a series is to just put someone else in the part and don't explain it. He's <laughs> just walk in and it's a completely different person. I'm sorry, uh, there seems to be some sort of uh, misunderstanding. I'm looking for Ray Vecchio. Eh? Uh, Raymond Vecchio, the detective. You talked to Welch, right? Uh, yes, I did. Good. So we're on the right track. Look, I'm glad you're back, Fraser, because things have not been the same around here. Obviously. And you want to know why? As a matter of fact, yes, I do. Traditionally, what you would do is have one or two or three shows where you phase the old person out and you bring in the new person. I thought, well, we could just use that as backstory that, for, that would form an episode later on, and we'll just start it off and it'll be odd. It would set a, a tone right away. I've been trying to get to you to talk to you about this. Uh, there's an operation going on. This operation comes from way up the ladder. Details are kind of sketchy, but all we need to know is Ray Vecchio has gone deep undercover with the mob. Now, to protect his identity, we have to make believe that this guy is Ray Vecchio. I see. 
seeing that I had agreed to the show, then it had to be a good idea. Um, not knowing, because it's very hard, how do you replace somebody and how do you, um, somebody who has a following or somebody who, you know, that, that you know, I, I, you know, I wasn't in a position to ask too many questions or go how, because they would have probably had to, to write episodes of what happened to that other character because they didn't resolve it by the end of the season before. Kind of thinking about it, though, sort of weirdly daring now. <laughs> Not sure if I'd do it again, but it was, it was funny. It did create a different dynamic, and I thought the dynamic that was created the second time around and the way all the characters really started to come together and blossom. They started to give, uh, spread it out more, you know. I mean, the first year especially, uh, and the second year, Paul and David were working like, especially Paul, 16 hours a day because they were the whole show. And uh, they were really, really working, and we weren't. It was a lot more interesting to me because it was more of an ensemble um, feel to it and energy, you know, and so I really appreciated that as an actor and a viewer. Detective Division. It's them! It's them! Get them on speaker! Where are you guys? Sink something. What sink? Uh, kitchen sink, perhaps. Where is your sink? Sink. Sink. We're sinking. Give them the coordinates, Rick. I think we're roughly 47 degrees latitude. 47 degrees latitude. 85 degrees longitude. 85. Write that down. In the episode Mounty on the Bounty, that all started because we were shooting another episode of Juice Cells down by the lakeshore here in Toronto. The funny thing about that show, though, was that in my mind, I'd had two lake boats. These freighters are about 820 feet long. And they're just solid steel. And I thought, well, we'd just have a good boat and a, ba and a bad boat, and they'd get together, and there'd be this you know, boat-to-boat -boat fight. <clears throat> so we got all of the lake boat guys in, and they were all sitting around. And they're tough, and they've got you know, their belt buckles all face the ground, and they're very big, muscly with you know, tattoos and everything. And this guy said, you can't put two boats together. I said, why not? Because if they smash into each other, they'll break and they'll sink. So we can't get two boats together? No. Yeah, unless you could hold one of them in place with tugs. We'll get these tugboats out. I said, okay, how many tugboats will we need? 28. All right, well, we'll get 28 tugboats. There are only three in Lake Ontario. Oh, okay. So then we were screwed because we couldn't do the two boat thing. And the whole climax with the two boats coming together. And we happened to be shooting an episode. We were down, on the, down along the lakefront. And I l just glanced over, and, and behind this building were three uh, masts standing up with rigging on them. I think I might have something that fits the bill. The magic. And as he's looking at it, here comes the bounty ship, the real bounty ship from the 1960 Marlon Brando movie, the exact replica of the original one. I was just sitting there <laughs> with all these white sails, and I thought, oh my god, that would be beautiful. I have all these red mounties and these white sails on a wood little wooden boat out in the water. And so we ran up onto the boat, and I said, "How do we? Uh, can we just use this?" Sure. And it was an, it's a non-for-profit boat that circumnavigated the globe like seven times, and so we went and spent a week and a half or something floating around on this boat. It was absolutely delirious. I remember Paul saying to me at one point, because he was then executive producer and I was creative producer, and I remember him saying to me, "How do we get this budget approved? How do we? What do we do?" And I, I remember saying to him, usually, Paul, what happens is that you and me and Frank would have to go and talk to the suits and convince them that we should do this. Now, we're the suits. <laughs> because we were suddenly in the role of the guys who had to decide. I said, oh, well, that's easy. Let's do it. <laughs> and that was it. Because how do you justify a wooden boat? I mean, Bob Carney, who was a co-executive producer, said, 
what, what do you mean a wooden boat? How do we have a wooden boat? What, who, who, who would have a wooden boat? And I said, well, man, some crazy Mountie guy off in the woods somewhere has decided that we should be a naval power. We could have a wooden boat. He said, that's ridiculous. Yes, but you, know, you could just write it that way, couldn't you? So we did. We had this renegade. <laughs> Mountie's supposed to be training them off in the woods in, I don't know, survival techniques or something, has them actually building a big wooden boat. She had a long-standing dispute with headquarters regarding the future of the force. Her position was that we should revamp and develop ourselves into a fully-fledged naval power. Naval power? Mm. Well, why not? What's the point of having a strong federal force without a strong naval power? I don't think that we need to get into that right now, Sergeant. You know what's over there? No. The United States of America. That would be a foreign power. A damn big one, too. We have a special relationship with the United States, Sergeant. Oh, no, sure. England and Spain get along now. But don't forget about the Spanish Armada. Think about it. If Nelson hadn't been ready, we'd all be speaking Spanish, and I have no love for Romance languages. Are you an American? Oh, that was great. God. Spend most of the day floating around the harbor on that wooden ship and then shooting off cannons. And... Yeah, that was, that was a great, great episode. You gonna take the transfer? I don't think so. You? Me? No. All right, so we're we're still. Uh... I think. Okay. Good. Right here. Trying to wrap up a series like this is really, it's more or less impossible, I think. And, and usually, I think it's really the case when you have this many continuing characters trying to, how do you finish something? Ray, you all right? I'm under 30 feet of snow. How could that be all right? Well, you're alive. Start digging. So we tried as best we could to kind of wrap out, give it a sense of completion, and yet still leave a little bit of a hole. But the overriding impulse with it was that the story, the, the series due south began in the north and it had to return to the north. You break something in your face? Not that I'm aware of. Look, we're 100 miles from nowhere and a frozen wasteland, and you're grinning like an idiot. I'm home. So that then in turn meant that it had to somehow tie back to uh, to Gordon Pinson's character, to my father's character. It was, it was uh, uh, well done, I believe. Uh, you know, well put together on paper and so on. Uh, and again, allowed for moments that would not necessarily show up in regular episodes. Uh, finding where the mother had been buried and uh, going, back to the, going back to that, showing something a little more heartfelt than what we had seen before. Something in the air. There's something stirring there. You feel it? Yeah. You know, I've had, uh, I've had some very odd dreams lately. About your mother? Yeah. You? No. I'm dead, I don't dream, so I don't know what this sensation is that I've got. Although it's very similar to when Walter Singlefoot laced my tea with knickknick, then seemed to turn into a 12-foot alligator before my very eyes. I don't know, it feels like... It feels as though your mother is very close. Very close. The character of my mother had been in that... been lurking one way or another in this series right from the beginning and only sort of glancingly dealt with. And so it felt really as though that's something we had to kind of come around to. And even if it was only going to be brief, it would seem somehow to make Fraser finished, or I don't know how to explain that. It just seemed emotionally the thing that we needed to try to accomplish. I think there wasn't an awful lot more that could have been done. You know, the advice had been given. 
Which way is this kid going to go? What's he going to do now? What will everybody do? You're fading. I've solved my last crime. I caught my last man. No reason to hang around. Should I, uh... I thought you were permanent. Oh, so. Nothing's permanent. Caroline? Mom. I'm not, you know, there are things that I would love to do differently with that episode, but there's a lot about it that I really thought was tremendous. And again, it was an enormous experience for everybody to, photo, to shoot it because we were in the Rockies, Rocky Mountains, and it, it was really, everything you see is really kind of there, including most of the snow work and the toboggan runs. And it was, it was, but it was a bittersweet one to do. It was sort of awful that kind of way, knowing that we're probably coming to the completion of it all. I'm most proud that the show has traveled around the world and continues to do so, and that's very rare. Most television shows don't travel anywhere. And there was something about the combination of people from Callum to David to me to Camilla Scott to Gordon Pinsett to Leslie to Paul Haggis to everybody, George Bloomfield, everybody who worked on it, Steve DeMarco, Frank Syracuse, there's so many people. Somehow the combination of all of that came up with something that the world had interest in. And that's very difficult to do. The world is, <clears throat> as we all know, increasingly kind of fractured and not that interested. Uh, it's very hard for shows to travel and we hit something that, for the life of me, I don't understand it, but this plays, this was the number one show when it was running in Iran. I don't know how that happened. But it's it's a source of great pride, yeah.